On the next Louisville Life, this Oscar season, Louisville Life takes a dramatic turn. Find out how much Hollywood owes its success to the Hoosier State. Meet a local man who played important roles in the production and promotion of the Star Wars series. And on guard, fencing jumps from the big screen to a local fascination. And learn more about two film icons, one born in Louisville and one in LaGrange. Welcome to Louisville Life, KET's weekly magazine series. I'm your host, Candace Cliff. Our neighbor to the north, Indiana, may seem as far as it gets from the hills and the hype of Hollywood. But in fact, many Hollywood success stories have their roots firmly planted in the Hoosier State. To defend that statement, Jane McClue turns to the man who wrote the book about it. Author and former TV host David Smith has his own version of the game Six Degrees of Separation. Instead of connecting to actor Kevin Bacon, as many do, Smith links Hollywood to his home state of Indiana. I guess the spark came when I was hosting When Movies Were Movies, and I was doing the writing and the research for that, and I was constantly surprised by the number of Indiana people I would run across. So I thought that was very interesting, so I began to collect information about them. And I would cut out clippings and, of course, uh, put my, the research that I did personally into a big file and it got bigger and bigger. And he brought in his uh, book project to us and we were immediately floored uh, by the vast wealth of information he had as well as the uh, hundreds of uh, famous uh, photographs of these figures he had. Smith and the Indiana Historical Society turned out to be a match made in cinematic heaven, resulting in this bouncing 600-page, six-and-a-half-pound coffee table book, Hoosiers in Hollywood. Subjects range from icons like James Dean, TV favorites such as Brady Mom Florence Henderson, to lesser knowns like James Best or Fred Williamson. Smith features folks in front of and behind the camera and starts before movies had sound, including his own personal favorite, silent star Monty Blue. For the Historical Society, the project puts a spotlight on the Hoosier State. It's a little known aspect of Indiana's history. Uh, people have heard of these figures, but may not necessarily know that they lived in Indiana, spent a good part of their time here, and consider themselves Hoosiers. Also, uh, because we're trying to reach out to a wider uh, audience than we have in the past. The Society for many years is known for its scholarly publications, but in the past few years we tried to reach a more general audience, and Hoosiers in Hollywood fit right in with our publishing plans in that area. And this is a good way to get them, get their foot in the door, uh, to get them interested in Indiana's history, and then lead them off into uh, other areas that they might be interested in. And the IHS hope your feet lead you to the accompanying exhibition at the Historical Society's impressive Indianapolis facility. They say this crowd pleaser is an important reminder that history is more than just dry dates and dead heroes. People who are uh, in school, their teachers always try to get them to memorize dates and figures in history. And that really puts a lot of people off. And history is really people. It's their stories, uh, what they achieve. Uh, the triumphs and the tragedies. A section of the exhibition focuses on a famous Hoosier who met a tragic end. Well, Carol Lombard is um, forgotten by a lot of people today uh, because she died so early. She died at the age of 33, and as we all know, she was on her way back to Hollywood from Indianapolis, where she had done a war bond uh, tour, a very successful one, and her plane crashed on the way back to Hollywood. The book notes that Carol Lombard was directed in the movie 20th Century by her Hoosier cousin, Howard Hawks, proof that David Smith is even good at linking Hoosiers in Hollywood to each other. 
For example, director Sidney Pollack, who has visited the exhibit and is featured in a special section of it, had a role in boosting the career of a fellow Hoosier. He uh, discovered Greg Kinnear. Uh, I don't know whether he knew Kinnear was a Hoosier or not when he put him in uh, Sabrina, but Greg Kinnear has said that he'll be forever grateful to Sidney Pollack uh, for that. Indiana native Steve McQueen's only Oscar nomination came for a movie directed by Hoosier Robert Wise. So should you be a Hoosier in Hollywood? One of the interactive aspects of this exhibition are touch screens that ask you questions to figure out what role you would best fill on a film crew. The exhibition also gives a nod to movies filmed in Indiana, including 1992's A League of Their Own. Bloomington-born uh, actor Denny Miller returned to Indiana for his first Indiana. movie role. He had a bit part in the film Some Came Running. We shot in Madison. Half of the people in uh, Kentucky and Indiana were in the film. It starred Frank Sinatra and Dean Martin and Shirley MacLaine. And I had a minor role in it and uh, being a contract player at MGM. Miller would go on to play Tarzan, one of three Hoosiers to take on the eight-man role. And I tried to do uh, as much research as I could to see if there was any other state who had more than three Tarzans, and I couldn't find any. So we had Elmo Lincoln, who was the very first Tarzan from Rochester, Indiana, and then we had James Pierce, who was the last silent Tarzan. Uh, from Franklin, Indiana, and James Pierce uh, married Edgar Rice Burroughs' daughter, Joan Burroughs. So that, I guess, kind of helped him get the part. So head north instead of west to step along the Walk of Fame or travel the pages of Hoosiers in Hollywood for more stargazing. It's a great book just to have on the coffee table and uh, delve into from time to time. Uh, pick a particular artist, a director, actor, actress you might be interested in and learn more about them and then branch out, uh, see their movies, uh, maybe visit uh, where uh, they were born, uh, where they lived and really get that uh, rich experience uh, that the book can offer. If you want to check out the Hoosiers in Hollywood exhibition at the Indiana Historical Society, you still have time. The exhibit remains open through April 29th. Now imagine this as a movie script. A Hoosier earns a doctorate in classical archaeology and then uses his skills to figure out where in Tunisia they shot the desert scenes from the first Star Wars movie. That feat gains him attention and a job from Star Wars director George Lucas. Meet David West Reynolds, a modern-day Indiana Jones who's actually from Indiana. All right, the only problem is, since our rope's too short, if something goes wrong with me, yep. I drop off the end of it 25 feet. Right. So, 30 feet, actually. How does an archaeologist go from a PhD program in very serious archaeology with very serious professors to digging up Star Wars artifacts in the Sahara? Um, I never planned to end up at Lucasfilm. But I was working in Egypt at one point. We were on an expedition from the University of Michigan, and that expedition was retracing ancient Roman caravan routes across the eastern desert from the Nile to the Red Sea. And while all this was quite fascinating on an archaeological level, it also occurred to me that if all this stuff is left from 2,000 years ago, I'll bet a film crew would have left something from 20 years ago. And I really did like that Star Wars movie. And I set up a private expedition to go to Tunisia, North Africa, on the edge of the Sahara, to see if I could use my archaeology techniques and track down the lost filming sites to that original Star Wars movie that had been shot in 1976. Of course, I called them and said, could you help me find these locations? And they said, well, we don't really have any of information about that. Nobody thought the film was going to be a success. We didn't save anything. They didn't know. They put me through at one point to the production manager. I wrote to him. He called me and gave me the best he could remember. Oh, yeah, the Star Wars locations, right. I, I, I'm pretty sure, you know, Luke Skywalker's homestead. Yes, yes, I remember that, and I'm ready to write it down. So I'm pretty sure on the road to Algeria, that was on the left. And that's literally what I had to work with. It's like, okay, it's up to archaeology now. And my colleague and I, who's now a member of Phaeton Group, we went through that country and we tracked them down 
and the sets were still there, and the artifacts were still there. Bones, there had been fiberglass dinosaur bones that show up in the movie were still lying in the sand after 20 years. Nobody had ever moved them. So it was, it was just a test thing that I did for my own entertainment for the most part. So I got home and I wrote an article about it. And it's the first article I ever pitched to an editor um, where, of, of one of my expeditions where the editor responded, Dude, that rules! They printed an article about it and the article ended up in the hands of Lucasfilm just as they were getting ready to go back to Tunisia to scout locations for the upcoming prequel Star Wars movies. And they had just called their archives and said, give us the location information where we shot the first movie. And they told them the same thing they told me. We don't have any information on that. So George Lucas's right-hand man, Rick McCallum, is thinking, what am I going to do? You know, this, I, we don't have this background information. And this article lands on his desk. And he says, get this David West Reynolds on the phone. And that led to them hiring me. So I became a location scout. They took me to Tunisia. We spent a couple of weeks running around the country. I showed them the old locations. They said, how did you find this stuff? I said, ah, archaeology, the real thing. And so they ended up taking me into their confidence and saying, well, you know, we've got this new movie coming out. Here's the kinds of locations we need. So then I helped them scout locations for the new picture, which ended up on the screen. We had such a good time in that two weeks that they ended up saying, Honey, you fit in. You work with the group. You're not the insane fan we thought you'd be. Come back to Skywalker Ranch with us. And I said, What do you need an archaeologist for? They said, It doesn't matter. We'll think of something. And they did. I ended up taking the job at the ranch, and I, I ended up writing seven books for them. I ended up doing marketing. I ran one of the world's top 100 websites for two years, the StarWars.com website. I worked on MTV music videos. I was the creative consultant for a movie trailer um, for the first one that came out for episode one. I got an amazing education in marketing and communications from the best people in the business. I founded Phaeton Group in 2000, right after I left Lucasfilm. Phaeton Group is dispersed across this country and a couple of others. And the adventure science missions are the flashy part of Phaeton Group. We work with the Navy, the U.S. Naval Sea Systems Command. We boarded the radar invisible ship Sea Shadow because they wanted us to help the public understand it better. We were there covering the launch of Spaceship One in Mojave. Um, that, that ship moved like 150 feet in front of me when I, when I watched that happen. I saw that history being made. And whether it's archaeology, whether I'm working in space exploration, I'm interested in getting out of this material, what can we learn that's valuable to us today to make the right choices now? That's what it's all about for me, and that's what Phaeton Group takes this broad team to dig out that information, and I'm the one that presents it to people that need it. Another addition to David's resume, his latest NASA book on the Kennedy Space Center recently received a full page in this month's Smithsonian Air and Space magazine. In this week's Etc., two additional local ties to Tinseltown, these on the Kentucky side. Referred to as the Shakespeare of the screen, film pioneer D.W. Griffith was born in Oldham County, Kentucky, and was the industry's first major producer-director. In 1889, a young Griffith and his family moved to Louisville after his father died. Later, his love for literature and theater led him first to the stage and then to motion pictures. In only five years, D.W. Griffith went from bit player to the industry's leading director. He also created and perfected such cinematic techniques as the close-up and the flashback. Griffith's 1915 epic, The Birth of a Nation, was the most profitable film for more than two decades. Starting out as an actor in Griffith's films, director Todd Browning also helped Kentucky make a mark in the movies. As a young man, Todd Browning ran away from his Louisville home to join a circus. This may have had a lot to do with his penchant for the weird and unusual, which were the hallmarks of his movie career. Called the master of macabre, Todd Browning directed the classic Dracula in 1931. He also appears in the film as the voice of the harbor master. Browning's other works include the bizarre cult classic Freaks and several films with legendary actor Lon Chaney Sr. Their collaboration has been called one of the great partnerships in the history of film. For more on these important Louisville Hollywood connections, visit www.ket.org slash 
Show business eyes from both coasts focus on Louisville this time of year during the Humana Festival of New American Plays at Actors Theater of Louisville. Jennifer Bielstein, the new managing director of ATL, joins us to talk about the festival and more. First of all, welcome to Louisville Life. And I should say, I guess, welcome to Louisville because you're pretty new to our city. I am. I've just been here three and a half months and I love it. It's a fabulous place to live. Tell us a little bit about your background and what brought you to Louisville. Sure, sure. Um, my entire career has been in theater. I fell in love with theater when I was in high school. Um, I just really love that collaborative process. It's all of these people working together to put on a play. And I decided that my interests were on the business side of theater. I've never wanted to be an actress <laughs> or, or be on the artistic side. Um, so I went to college at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and I studied business and theater, moved to Chicago right after, and have been, uh, was most recently executive director for a company in Chicago called Writers Theater. Um, before that, I was with Steppenwolf Theater, several other theaters, and even uh, the nonprofit Zoo in Chicago for a short mm -hmm. time. And uh, this job is just, it was so appealing when I learned that Sandy was retiring. Um, I had admired Actors Theater and the Humana Festival, especially for, for decades. And um, it was really the opportunity of a lifetime for me, really a dream, dream opportunity. And um, I pursued it, and I'm really pleased to, to be here. You mentioned Sandy Spear, who has a long history at Actors Theater. What's it like filling those footsteps and those shoes at Actors? Sure. Um, they're definitely big shoes to fill, and I am honored to have the opportunity to fill them and uh, do my best to... to I, f I feel like the baton has been passed. Sandy was responsible for founding the whole regional theater movement. He was a huge part of that, and I had admired him from afar for years as an arts administrator. He's respected around the country, and um, it, now the baton is being passed to, to a new couple of people to take Actors Theater forward and take the regional theater movement forward. and. Um, Again, they're big shoes to fill, but I'm, I'm excited about the challenge to do it. And he has been um, very, very supportive and helpful to me so far in my introduction to this community and to the theater. You also mentioned the Humana Festival. This is your first time to do that as a staff member, but you say you admired it for years. You have even mm -hmm. attended it before. What was your impression as an outsider of the festival and of ATL? Yeah, I um, really enjoyed my visit to the Humana Festival. Um, it's a little um, daunting in advance. You think, oh, how can I see seven plays in two and a half days? I love theater, but do I really want to sit in the mm -hmm. theater that long? And it's amazing. It's really amazing. The energy that the festival creates uh, by bringing these productions, these new works to full-scale productions is really exciting to be a part of. And it's really uh, a very collegial atmosphere at the festival, um, both amongst people who are theater professionals and even just the, the local audience members and Actors Theater subscribers who are there. You get to interact with each other just in the lobbies and at different events in between the shows. So um, I really fell in love with it uh, from my attendance at the festival last year. How have things gone for you so far in your short tenure here at Actors Theater? And, and what do you look to do in the future? Sure. Um, it's been a whirlwind of activity. It has been um, just three and a half months of meeting hundreds and hundreds of people. It's such a welcoming community, both Louisville in general and the people who are part of Actors Theater, the board and the audience members and other donors and supporters of the theater and the, the hundred plus staff members who we have. Mm -hmm. So um, that's been uh, fun and exciting getting to know everybody and uh, learning the organization. I have a huge respect for the history of Actors Theater and it has been a really well run and responsible and successful mm -hmm. theater so I want to uh, examine how we've done things and why we've made those choices and then Mark Masterson the artistic director and I will work together and develop a shared vision for what along with the board as well for where we think the theater should go for the next five to ten years and and hopefully beyond. A lot of people like to go to the theater and see a play they already know something about, mm -hmm. A Christmas Carol, Dracula, A Tune of Christmas, three standards at Actors Theater. But what would you tell local folks about the Humana Festival and why they should go and try these new plays on this 31st anniversary of the festival? Sure. The Humana Festival is like the Sundance of, of new play festivals. So if you're a theater professional, theater practitioner, or theater lover, living anywhere else in the country, you know of the Humana Festival and you want to go. Um, so in Louisville, I don't know if everybody knows how, how respected it is across the country. I think many people do. But um, so I think it's exciting to be something that, be, to attend something that's such 
that's so important to the world of American theater. Um, I, you know, we we have generated over 300 new plays through the festival, and um, you know there'll be seven of them in the festival this year. It's really easy to just pick a night and pick any show and just give it a try. It's um, it's new work, so it's a risk. Um, but I'm really excited about the shows this year. I think they all have. Um, universal appeal. There's a theme in each of them that I think people can relate to. Um, whether it's uh, the, the search for the American dream or um, feeling like the weight of the world is on your shoulders. Or there's one about internet predators, which um, hopefully not many people have been a victim of, but it's an interesting exploration of how, um, how violent mm -hmm. that, that can become. Um, and uh, and there's one about rites of passage, uh, specifically bachelor and bachelorette parties. Hmm. So there's a range of work, and they're all really interesting. And I um, there are many ways to get tickets, a range of prices, and so I, I hope people will take advantage of it. Sounds very contemporary, but it's also our chance in Louisville to say we saw it when it was first put on the stage, you know, and, and some of these go on to win Pulitzer Prizes and win many awards. So yeah, and you're exciting. part of the process as an audience mm -hmm. member uh, at the Humana Festival. I mean, it's the these these plays are brought to full-scale production. What often happens with new plays is a playwright is given a grant, a theater does a staged reading of it, and then it's never given a full-scale production or never has a future life. But with the, the generous and longtime support of the Humana Foundation, these plays get full-scale productions, and we are actively invested in bringing people in to see them so that they can go on to future lives. And the audience responses are part of what happens to them in their next production. Well, it's certainly a gem to have Actors Theater in Louisville, and we thank you for coming by to tell yeah. us about your new role. Thank you. Learning to fence was standard for actors back in the day, and today those interested in fencing for stagecraft or sport would be happy to learn that Louisville is home to one of the finest fencing facilities in the U.S. Maestro Les Stowicki was a Polish national fencing coach before he came to Louisville in 1992 to start a fencing program here. Now, 15 years later, he has created a passion for this martial art. Fencing belongs to fighting sport. We have a couple different sports. We have like a, a, a metrical sports and, and, and one is the fighting. Fighting is the fencing, boxing, wrestling. You have, a, you have opponents against you and you compete. You try to win. You have to show the aggressivity. And aggressivity is supposed to be under control. And you have to, you have to uh, think what you're doing. You have to analyze before and after. And you have always deficit of time because action is going like a 250 milliseconds. Can you imagine how quick is this sport? I used to live in, in this, in Soviet, it was former Soviet Union. And, and uh, I, I go through the park, I saw the people doing something with, with something like this. And I came and asked the coach, could I do something like this? And she said, hey, let's go. I was a 14, 14 year old that time. And that's my life. I'm doing this for, my, for all my life. I, I was a fencer. I, was, I teach in college. I teach in, in, in national teams. Now I'm in Louisville. <laughs> We have a couple things in fencing. We have like a food work, blade work, and fencing bout, and individual lesson, and I am doing this. Now, if you see those, those kids working, they are beginners. I teach them the basic. Some of them cannot tie shoes. Some cannot walk, some cannot run. That's my duty. I'm a, I'm a teacher. I'm not a, just a fencing coach. I got it. I love fencing because it's so intense. When you fence someone, you're putting everything you have. Like, you're faster, you're smarter, I mean, you're just putting everything you have against another person. You're testing yourself against them. So if you win, it's all because of your skills and the way you set it up. And basically, you're just you're testing yourself, and it's all about passion. In essence, it's kind of like a really, really complicated rock paper scissors. Fencing is different from many sports. It's described by many, you might have heard this already, as physical chess. And uh, it's, it's more than just uh, a physical game. It's, 
it's fi at least 50% mental, 50% physical. There are three different types of weapons. There's foil, which is what I do. It's, it's a little bit lighter. And there's, uh, there's epe, which is about a heavier version of the foil, basically. It's got a larger guard. And uh, there's also saber, which is a slashing weapon. And um, it doesn't have a tip on it. When you first get up on a strip, um, you have to test the weapons and test the equipment to make sure it's working. And depending on whether or, whether, whether or not you know your opponent, you have to start piecing together different pieces of information that ultimately tell you what to do. And you're trying to build your attack, but at the same time you're trying to build your, your parries and how to defend against your opponent's attack, because he's trying to build his attack as well. When we just do practice bouts, we are usually focusing on one aspect of our fencing, and you, a lot of times it enlists the cooperation of your partner. You have to set up mock bouts, mock fencing, so it's more like if this happens, what do you do? If your opponent does this, how do you react? How do you lure this opponent into this trap? You're basically setting up traps and situations that you would use in regular bouts. An attack can consist of several different components. There's, you can make a simple attack, which would just be a basic lunge and maybe a straight extension of the arm. Or it could be me chasing someone down to the end of the strip and trying to look for the best place to finish and hit. Our coach is great. I mean, he is he's so diligent and he just he wants the best for us and he he's the kind of coach who really cares about how we do. Whenever whenever we win, it's almost <laughs> he, he almost like, you know, he's almost more excited about it than we are. Uh, everyone could be fencing. We have a left hand and right hand. We have a tall and short. We have a skinny and we have a thick. You have to have a brave heart brave because it's a fighting is you know that's that's the i will take every brave person doesn't matter how it looks like i don't care you saw experienced and novice fencers practicing the louisville fencing center offers classes for both year round maestro stewicki has also created a wheelchair program Haley and Reggie are already professionals in the sport. They both compete internationally, and Haley has a scholarship to Notre Dame next fall to become part of the college's fencing team. Thanks for joining us this week on Louisville Life. Don't forget, you can catch us on KET2 Thursday nights at 7.30 and noon on Sundays. See you next time.